James Bag here, and I'm going to be comparing the 2008 album Fearless by Taylor Swift with the 2021 album Fearless, Taylor's version in parenthesis by Taylor Swift. Okay, this is track one, uh, Fearless. Immediately, there is a huge difference in the sound of her voice. She sounds like a little kid in the original version. She sounds like a, a fully adult woman in the second version. The, the little guitar hook there seems a little out of place amongst this richer orchestration. Um, maybe a little too simple. I don't know. It stands out. The drums are way more... Now I want to throw around the word epic, a kind of a meme word, but these are... these drums are epic. Mandolin sounds great. This is track two, 15. The song's probably a little less condescending to Abigail now that Taylor Swift is looking back at her experiences as a 30 year old that when she wrote the song when she was like 17 or whatever. Abigail's good friend. Folk was a little more breathy. She sounded more like a mom than a teenager. Abigail gave everything she had to a boy. Everything she had. I don't know. That doesn't... You're putting too much importance on your virginity there. Tay, you're more than just your, um, I don't want to say hymen, I don't know, whatever, she, it's, it's a cute song, not my favorite on the album. This is track three, Love Story. There's somebody in the background just like plucking on a muted string, like, randomly. That's probably not random, it's probably very specifically timed. I'm sure this has been commented on a million times, but it doesn't make sense that she's using Romeo and Juliet as her example of this beautiful love story. It takes me out of the song every time. It's not a gag or a bit. I do like this version a lot more than the original. I think I like all of the new versions better, but this one I like considerably better uh, than the original. It's just, it's, it's well put together, it sounds great. So you got this relationship between these, these, these two young people and she is so full of self-doubt and she's like thinking that he's on the, the brink of, of ending the relationship and he kneels to the ground, pulls out a ring, he's talked to the dad, which is weird. I don't, I don't like Taylor Swift's father in the documentary. He gave me some weirdo vibes. Um, the idea of this antiquated notion of having to ask someone's father for their, for like the, the, like the dad owns the kid. I don't know. Uh, the, there's no communication in this relationship. Well, that's the end of the song. This is track four. Uh, hey, Steven. Her sounding like an adult in the song definitely uh, makes a, a weird difference. This, this is definitely a song that's from the perspective of a, of a teenager. And she does not sound like a teenager. Seems like the piano got a little less funky in this version, which is a shame because I love that little funky piano thing from the original. Dim in the street lights, you're perfect for me. Why aren't you here tonight? One with the dorky laugh there. Good. I think I like the original version better. This one seemed simpler. Like the sen the sentiment was was uh, more pure. It was this cute little ditty, 
and now it's it's all blown up and I don't know if it, I don't know if it benefits from being blown up but I do love this song and I'm I'm, I'm being extra hard on it uh, because it just I love it so dang much this is track five white horse This aren't. This isn't our far, fair, This isn't our fairy tale. Is that was that in the original version? Did she change that? I don't know. Man, well, this twist at the end of the song, it's so good. Fuck this guy. You're so much better than him. Love this song. Are you okay, buddy? I gotta deal with my dog. This is track six, You Belong With Me. This is a bit of a problematic song, I think. The message here is I'm not like the other girls, um, so then what's wrong with the other girls? Kinda misogynistic. Uh, this is the first song I think I, ever knew as a Taylor Swift song, and I recognized that it was really poppy and fun, though. I mean, it doesn't take me out of it knowing that uh, it's a little bit sexist, but I mean, I mean, I guess I shouldn't be telling a woman what is or isn't sexist. I don't know. That bouncy little chorus is, 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 is pop perfection. Track seven, breathe. She can't breathe without him, but she has to. It sounds stupid, but it's uh, it's very poetic. The way that she says it. I, this album came to me during a breakup in my life, and this song has always destroyed me. Muting the guitars on this version it, it was a good choice. It was a little too rockin'. I mean, I, I would never complain about the original version, but I think that making it less rockin' is an improvement. The sorries? The sorries at the end? Oh my god. Whew. This is track eight, Tell Me Why. The song's always sounded like there's a bit of a jamboree going on. I think like a, like a like a like a potluck in in the Appalachians sounds like they've really tightened up over the last twelve years. It's been twelve years, twelve years, thirteen years, Thir thirteen. It's Tay's favorite number. I think we all know someone who seems like they've read a book on how to ruin someone's perfect day. I have to admit, this song has not really been on my radar. I don't think it's a bad song. I've just never taken the time to really digest it. Is, is she talking about a boyfriend or, or just like a person in her neighborhood? Because this person sounds horrible. And if it's a boyfriend, this is a very abusive relationship. Uh, this is... This is track nine, You're Not Sorry. This seems like uh, a predecessor to Enchanted. The seeds are there. Not my favorite kind of Taylor Swift song. It's a good song, it's just not for me. It's very dramatic. I gotta give you that there. It's dramatic. Like even the songs in this album that I don't love, <clears throat> I don't hate, I think that's a good song. 
I just, it doesn't do it in a particular form for me. <coughs> this is track 10, The Way I Loved You. Short story about this song. Uh, I was talking to a friend about it once, and they were telling me that that uh, it really broke their heart listening to it. And I said, why? Because you feel like you're the main character in the song, that, uh, that you're the boring partner in the relationship, that, the, that your love isn't a passionate one. He said, no, I just, I think it's heartbreaking that it's happening to this fictional character. This is one of the meanest things I ever said to anyone. And in retrospect, now that I've known this guy for like 10 years after that, he is some chaos energy, I tell you. That was a bad read. Oh, it's got like a marching band kind of chug to it, which is fun. I think the message behind this song is so cute and fun, but I can only imagine how this is twisted and warped in some listeners' minds who are in abusive relationships and they're like, no, this isn't bad or toxic, it's uh, exciting. And, you know, he only, uh, you know, smacks me in the face because he's so passionate about me. I do think it's really cute and fun, though. So much rain imagery. She loves rain. She she did anyway. Oh, she still sings about rain stuff. Oh, she got good rain content. This is track eleven, forever and always. Is that Travis Barker on the skins? Who's who? who is it? Did I say something way too honest? Made you run and hide like a scared little boy. Let's unpack what she's saying here. Did I say something way too honest? Like I feel like. She's not open to the possibility that she said something wrong. If she did anything wrong, it, that, it, it was that she was too honest and he couldn't handle it. And then she's talking about him, which is like she's just name calling with the little boy remark. I think there's been two songs about Tuesdays on this album, which is interesting. Travis Barker-esque. Here's the everything coming out of nothing. Here's the silence that cuts me to the core. Ooh, and then it gets all quiet. That's a great moment. I'm not really comparing the songs anymore. I'm just talking about how much I love these songs. It's a great song. I think they made this song a little less hickory, a little less uh, pop country radio. Do, do people still say hickory? Is that a dated term? Feels about seven years old. This is track 12, The Best Day. I think this is one of the first things that endeared me to Taylor Swift as a songwriter was her love for her parents. And now it's the thing about her that I dislike the most because her parents seem like, I don't know, shit heels. The dad more than the mom. The mom just kind of looks like a female Chief Wiggum, which is mean of me to, I'm just, that's not cool to say. But she's always talking about how her mom's her best friend and y your mom shouldn't be your best friend. I know that I, don't have a relationship with my own mother, that probably, I'm just projecting on this whole thing and there's nothing wrong with loving your mom. This is a really sweet song and I don't want to take away from that. She's speaking from the perspective of a little kid who was made fun of at school by her so-called friends and her mom or her dad, I'm not sure, is taking her out for ice cream or french fries or something. But this kid is displaying some serious self-awareness, you know, I'm not sure. That's realistic, but just be a nitpicky here and it's cute the lyric about her little brother being better than her i don't know what that self-flagellation is all about i mean that's clearly not the case it's track 13 last uh last song on the album change this is my least favorite song on the album i don't think it's a bad song i don't think any of these songs are bad songs i love this album <clears throat> i think that the reason why I'm so hard on this song, or the reason why it's never done anything for me, is because one of my favorite Taylor Swift songs of all time is Long Live, the last song on Speak Now. And this song feels like uh, a, st a stepping stone to that version. 
Um, and so, I don't know, for whatever reason, I just disregard this. You know, it feels like a, like a, like a half-assed attempt at that song, but obviously it's a, it's a revolution. Also seems like they've really toned down the, uh, the guitar shredding on this and made it more of a traditionally orchestrated piece, which I think works in its favor. You know what I think? It seems, sounds to me instrumentally that she took what she learned from, from um, Long Live and brought it here because this is actually inspiring me. This is, this is some heavy hitting stuff. I'm feeling great. It's, it feels good. That that was good. That okay. I take it back. I've been too hard on that song. I had a great time listening to it. Well, that's it. That's the that's the full album. Final thoughts. I guess the songs that uh, I held most precious to me. I w I was a little more sensitive about the changes and the songs that didn't mean so much to me. For the most part, were were elevated. I guess the Scooter Braun stuff. I hope that that. This I hope this is profitable for her. I don't mean that in a snarky way. I know she has a lot of money. I think she is. I think she's a valuable personality, and I'm a big fan. I got a message for John Meyer. Before I go, one message for John Meyer, and that is, eat shit, you stupid, uh, tiny bitch. Love you, Tay. <laughs>